Today marks the start of a new series, or rather, an old, old series. Uh, it's going to be simply presented in a fashion that I hope will be memorable to each of you as you journey through it with us. It's an old series of an old, old story, a story uh, of which if I had 10,000 lifetimes to preach about, the subject itself would not be done justice. It is a story of which volumes could not possibly contain, of which songs, no matter how lovely, would come close to representing uh, the subject accurately and effectively, and one which to tell of its infinite value would be to try and empty the ocean using a teaspoon or a pie pit. It is a series which I think only needs a single name. You see it up on the screen. It should be highlighted for you. It is just simply Jesus. The old familiar hymn says, I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Another familiar song says it this way. It says, some people say I'm crazy, but I just can't explain the power that I feel. When I call upon your name, it's just like fire. Shut up in my bones, the Holy Ghost is moving, and he just won't leave me alone. There's something about the name Jesus. It's the sweetest name I know. Oh, how I love that name Jesus. It is the, sweet I, the sweetest name I know. Now, this Jesus, who we're going to talk about over the next several weeks, is unlike any other. Amen? Amen. Over the next several weeks, this Jesus, he is unlike any man that has ever been or walked the face of this earth. He spoke as never any man has spoken. This Jesus, the means by which God Almighty, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, has spoken to us in these the last days. Jesus, the heir of all things, and through whom also, the Bible says, he made the world. This Jesus, the Bible says, the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact representation of his nature, the one who upholds all things by the word of his power, this Jesus who, when he had made purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This Jesus, the Bible says, subjected himself to abject poverty, but he was elevated once again to a place far greater than the angels receiving a far more excellent inheritance than they. This Jesus today, the Bible says, is the head of the body, the head of the church. This Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, the begotten of the Father, the preeminent one. This Jesus in whom is all the pleasure and joy of the Father and in whom all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. The Son of Man He is without sin, and the Son of God He is with all power. This Jesus, though a son, learned humble obedience through suffering and trials. He would become the ultimate author of eternal salvation by death on a cross. He is the one whose broken heart and whose contrite spirit are far more glorious than the song of 10,000 angels to the Almighty God. By this Jesus comes our redemption. Amen. Amen. By this Jesus comes our justification. Amen. Amen. Our peace. Amen. Our joy. Amen. How many of you possess the Holy Spirit this morning? Amen. amen. And amen. And our blessedness in the world to come. This Jesus despised and rejected of men, the Bible says. Adored by the saints, he is the one unto which is committed all the judgment. Jesus, Jesus, that precious name, the name given unto him, that by that very name every knee will bow, whether it is in heaven, whether it is on earth, whether it is under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess, this Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is Jesus, amen? amen. And that was but the introduction. And over the next 11 weeks or so, I want to tell you the story of his life. Would that be okay? Yes. I want us to walk together with the Savior from the empty cradle to the empty tomb. And to do that today, I would invite you to turn with me to what might appear at first to be a mistake. But I can assure you it is not. Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 50 through verse 53, we'll finish out the gospel according to Luke. And once you found your place in Luke chapter 1, I want you to hold that spot and also found Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. So two focal passages this morning. Beginning at Luke 24, verse 50. And he, that is Jesus, led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, 
returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. Flip over to Acts with me, if you will, chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. May we pray this morning, church. Lord, our prayer this morning could not be any more simplistic. But show us to yourself in our gathering here today. Lord, we long for your companionship. Lord, we seek after your presence in our lives day in and day out. Where should we go? Where should we go? Oh, where should we go? But to the Lord, Jesus the Christ. Bless this time here together today. Not that we, we might benefit from it or that we might take from it but rather that your kingdom would be impacted in us in an everlasting manner. Father, I pray that you would remove this old preacher, for we know that there will be no preaching done lest the preacher come. I ask in the precious and in the holy and in the mighty name of Jesus, for it's in Christ's name. Amen and amen. We begin discussing the life of Jesus this morning in our message today that is simply entitled The Empty Cradle. You'll see that on the back of your bulletins there. And now if you are a very astute person, you would expect the preacher who is about to start or to endeavor to preach through the life of Jesus the Christ to start at the beginning with the birth of Jesus. You would perhaps expect to start with a message entitled A Full Manger. Or perhaps another clever title would be A Way in a Manger. But not the empty manger, not the empty cradle. And surely, if you were going to pick a text from which you were going to start talking about the life of Christ, it would not be all the way at the end of the gospel. And even beyond the gospel, the gospel into the first chapter of the book of Acts. So what gives? And I hope to answer that question by the end of the message today. As we talk through and discuss a topic which I don't believe gets enough attention or recognition within the church. And that is the ascension of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so to do so, we're going to look at the account from two different writings of the same person from the perspective of the dear physician, Luke. So while we're making our way through the message today, I want you to help me in thinking through these two questions. This is the way in which I thought about this in my mind. This is the way in which I compiled this message. So it makes the most sense to let you in on that as we present it. And the first question is this, what does the ascension mean? What does the ascension mean? You know, I was trying to think back to the last time that I heard a message that was based solely on the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, where the ascension is what was the key focal point. And it wasn't just mentioned in, in passing. And you know what? I really couldn't remember when the last time that took place was. So that's the first question we're going to ask is what does the ascension mean? And then the second question is this, the one I just presented to you a few moments ago. Why start with the ascension? Why is that the starting point if that took place at the end of his life and at the end of his earthly ministry? So those are the two questions we're going to be asking this morning. What does the ascension mean? And to answer that first question, I'm going to break it down into three headings. You'll see it on the back of your bulletin. No surprises there. The first one is that Jesus ascended as master. Amen? When Jesus was carried up into heaven... As the cloud received him out of their sight, the disciples' sight, it was the culmination of his earthly ministry. His work on this earth, this go-around, was done. And as he ascended into heaven, he ascended as master. He ascended as Lord. That's what the word Lord means. It means master. And we find in Acts chapter 2, the very next chapter in the book of Acts, in that wonderful Pentecostal sermon of Peter, in which he declares affirmatively and definitively that God the Father says to God the Son, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore know for certain that God has made him, that is Jesus, both Lord, Master, and Christ, Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. How many of you are willing to say this morning, He is Lord today, church? He is Lord! Today, church, though Jesus was crucified on earth, that did not stop him from being crowned in heaven. 
Though Jesus was scarred in this world, that did not stop him from being saluted when he entered into glory. Though he was marred beyond recognition here while he walked on the earth, so too was he marveled and is marveled upon as he reigns on the throne of Almighty God. And Paul tells us that Jesus has been given a name which is above every name, that at the mention of that name every knee would bow, every tongue would confess. And what would they confess? But that Jesus Christ is... Lord. And what does that term Lord mean? We don't really use that in our common parlance today. Wives, how many times do you look at your husbands and say, yes, Lord? How many times does that happen? That was a common thing in Old Testament times. You see, we are people which so desperately desire to be in control of our own affairs. We desire to be in control of our own destinies. We buck all authority because we don't see our complete dependency. Upon God, we think we can do something on our own and effect some meaningful change. But the book of Colossians tells us that not only did God create the world and everything in it, but literally, moment by moment, it says he holds all things together. And whether you realize that this morning or not, the moment that he stopped doing so would be the very moment that your life and my life and the life of everything that's ever been in existence ever ceased to be. That's the case according to the scripture. That's what Lord is. That's what a master is. It is someone upon which without you are completely and totally depraved. You can't do anything without that Lord, without that master. But here's the thing about the lordship or the mastery of Jesus. He does not force it upon you. He does not force it upon you. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 8, it reminds us that the Father has a past tense has subjected all things to Jesus. The Bible says he left nothing that is not subject to him. What is excluded from that statement? Not a thing. Not a thing. And then the verse continues, which is interesting. But now we do not see all things subjected to him. And that's where you and I currently reside on the timetable of eternity between the death blow being dealt upon the cross and the not yet of all things entering mandatory subjection to the mastery of Jesus. You see, we live in a time of grace, in the time of what I would call voluntary subjection to his lordship instead of mandatory subjection as these verses teach. So I turn to you this morning and I ask, has Jesus ascended to the peaks of your heart as master of your life? Hold up now, church. Has he really? Has he really? Paul writes to the Colossians. He reminds them that if that is the case, if the yes is the case, then their lives on earth would be a representation of their master in heaven. Are your lives filled with a devotion to prayer? Are your lives filled with alertness in your mind? Is it filled with thanksgiving in your heart? Is it filled with a gospel witness always and ever upon your tongue? That would be the case if we understood what it means that Jesus is our master. That's, that's the case if we understand what it means that Jesus is our Lord. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. The question that I often get, get asked, especially by people that are not of the faith, and this does not happen for Mill Creek Church. I want to be honest about that. I've never gotten that question within the church, but I get it a lot in witnessing and ministering to folks outside of the church. And the question is this. What gives him the right? What gives Jesus the right to be my master, to be my Lord? That's the question asked by the skeptic. It's the question asked by the unregenerate. You say, Pastor, that Jesus should reign in my life, but upon what basis should I let him reign? As if you have a choice in the matter. <laughs> let me just give you a key verse and then a brief illustration of that key verse. The verse is Romans chapter 14, verse 9. Beautiful verse. It says, For to this end Christ died and lived again. To what end? That he might be both Lord of the dead and of the living. Jesus should reign in your life because he died and he rose again. But he did not just die and he did not just rise again, but he did it personally. He did it for you. He did it for me. He did it for as many as would call upon his name. He took away, the Bible says, the sting of death, the sting of sin, the sting of the grave. He did that by the lashes 
upon his back by the crown of thorns placed upon his brow by the nails that were driven upon his wrists and in his feet. And as the illustration goes, there was a tribe in one of the most remote places in the world. Their chieftain had recently passed away. And it was time for another chief to take over in the tribe. There was a clear favorite. There was a clear front runner. His name was Yeshu. Everybody say Yeshu. Yeshu. But some of the members didn't like Yeshu. Why? Because to them he seemed as though he didn't love him. You know, Yeshu at times was hard. At times he was tough. Sometimes he was strict. Sometimes he was solemn. And that didn't lend itself to the kind of fun and festivities that they wanted to begin having in this tribe. And so on the day that the election was going to take place, Yeshu stood in the midst of the people and said to you, Some of you doubt my love for you and for this tribe. And then guess what he did? He began to recount for them the story of when a mountain lion had made its way into the camp. It had caused fear and terror, struck it within the hearts of the inhabitants. It killed some and it maimed others. But more than that, as it was about to escape, it ran away with a little one, with a child from the tribe, clasped between its jaws. What did Yeshu do? Yeshu ran toward the mountain lion without hesitation. He thrust his hand into the mouth of the beast, and at one time he secured the child and crushed the skull of the mountain lion. But he also mangled his arm beyond all recognition in the process. And he said to them, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't be willing to face death for you. And then in dramatic fashion, he lifted up that mangled arm and he declared in the name of my wounds, I declare the right to be your master. I declare the right by my wounds to be your Lord. And folks, if that don't get the fire burning, you, you will it's wet. That's just a fact of the matter this morning, church. Jesus, when he entered into the gates of heaven, when the Father saw him there and ran out to meet him, he said, by what means do you get the right? And he held up those hands. And he presented those feet, church. And he said, by my wounds. Amen. By my wounds. Amen. They are mine, Father. They are mine. And church, I cannot make this up. Look at what Jesus does in Luke 24 at the ascension. You may have missed it a thousand times over just like I have. He led them out. And what did he do, church? <laughs> he lifted up his hands. He led them out and he lifted up his hands. And as those hands are lifted, the very hands that bore the nails by which my sin was placed on the back and in the hands and in the feet and in the side of Christ, he departed and there he entered into heaven. And I cannot help but think that as gravity gave way and he ascended above, the disciples couldn't help but think by his scars we are healed. In the name of his wounds, he is my master. Amen and amen. Is he your master today? But he didn't just ascend as master. No, no, no. He ascended as forerunner. The Bible says that this is the hope we have as an anchor of the soul. It says Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest for us forever, it says in Hebrews chapter 6. Now, if you remember in your Old Testaments, how often could the high priest go into the presence of God? Once a year. Once a year, Once a year could he go into the presence of God. What would he have to do? He would have to wash himself religiously, ceremoniously. He would have to offer sacrifices for himself. He would then have to uh, guard himself with these priestly regalia. And then into the holy place he would go. Behind the veil he would go, taking with him the blood of the Lamb. As he stepped behind the veil, he would step there into the Holy of Holies, as it's known in the Old Testament, where he would sprinkle the blood of the Lamb and there make Atonement for the sin of the nation as a whole. Was his work ever finished? The work was never finished. Year after year he would go, have to go. Lamb after lamb would have to be slain. In the Holy of Holies there was no bench upon which he could recline if he became weary. There was no chair to rest if he became weak. His work was never finished. But church of Jesus, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 8, he did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. 
And he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice, not of lambs and of bulls and of goats and of sheep and of doves, the sacrifice of himself. And what's more than that, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 and 12 says, Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, that is Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sin for all time, guess what he did? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Why? Because the work for now is done. The work for now is done. The atonement has been made. Your sins have been paid for. They don't have to keep getting paid for. Guess what? When you sin today, it's under the blood. Amen? Now, does that mean that you go on and continue to sin? Paul says, God forbid. He says, may it never be that such would be the case, but that it would offend us to offend the Lord. The Bible says when Jesus ascended, that he took the blood of the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, and he entered once and for all the holy place, and there on the altar of heaven... He presented himself as the sacrifice for sin once and for all. And so there in the ascension, you have a picture. What of? Of my salvation. There in the ascension, you have a picture. What of? Of my redemption. There in the picture of the ascension, you have my deliverance. Church, Jesus is my high priest this morning. How about you? Amen. He is my high priest this morning. How about you? He has gone before me as forerunner to clear a path, to make a way. To offer atonement for my mistakes and my faults. And if my wife were here, she'd tell you how many they were. And I can't wait to be called home. I can't wait to partake in what he's up there preparing for me. That old mansion in glory. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what it would be like church? One last answer to the question. What does the ascension mean? But that Jesus ascended as victor. As the victor. Not only as master, not only as forerunner, but also as the victor. Paul writing to the Corinthian believers concerning our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 57, 15, verse 57. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Interesting thing about that word, gives there, it's continual. It's perpetual. It's the victory has been won and it's constantly being handed over to you. Just day in and day out. Just day in and day out. The victory is being yours. Church, I want you to know that when Jesus ascended into heaven, can I tell you something? He didn't go in defeat. Jesus didn't go into heaven in defeat. Though he was tattered and torn by the world, he did not have to sneak in shamefully in the back door of heaven. But rather he ran through the front gates leaping and boundering. Why? Because the victory was already won. You know, this old world thought that it had got the best of Jesus. That old adversary just knew that he had won. There at Calvary, while the captain of the Lord's army hung on that cross, uprode all of hell, led by the prince of the power of the air, the very adversary, the Satan, and there a battle ensued, the Bible says, the whole morning long. The swords and the spears and the javelins of infernal fury, they were impaled upon the Lord. The fiery arrows of hell, they plunged into the back and into the side of the Lord. And the bystanders, they cheered and they clapped and they carried on. And there it looked as though there was no hope for the captain of our salvation. What did he do? but laid down his life. But church, let me tell you something. <laughs> when the dust of battle had settled, there stood as a testimony the empty grave. <laughs> Occupied no longer. For friend, the resurrected Lord stood there in the midst of the battlefield, and in his hand he had the key to sin, to death, and to the grave. And with them he ascended on high as the victor. Amen this morning, church. Paul also tells us that we ought to give thanks to God because in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in Christ, he always leads us in triumphal procession. Now, we don't do this anymore. But back in the day, the conquering king or the conquering general, when he was coming back into town with all the spoils of war, he would have the streets lined for a procession so that the army could come and the spoils could come. And they could proclaim victory to that city. And in that possession, 
would be all the spoils of war and the food and the pillage that they had taken, all of the loot that they had won that was being brought back to the people of the land, and that would typically be up toward the front. And behind all the spoils of war would ride the conquering king or the conquering general. He would be sat atop his chariot. And then right behind him, chained to the chariot, were the kings and the people of the land which were conquered. That would be directly behind the chariot, chained to the chariot. And then behind him, or behind the chariot and those slaves and kings of the land, would be all the soldiers of war, would be all the mighty men, would be all the heroes who had fought bravely and valiantly and who were coming home as heroes. And all in one accord, they would be shouting, Triumphus! 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 Victory! Victory, victory. And the Bible says in the book of Colossians, now I can't make this up. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15, when Jesus had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Can you even believe it? You know, I can just imagine the street of gold line with all the saints of the Old Testament. You know, I can see Noah there. And Abraham there. I can see Isaac and Israel and David. I see the woman at the well and the woman caught in adultery. I see John the Baptist and he's still just as ugly and stinky as ever. But by glory, he's in heaven. Amen. But I can see them standing there and everybody's waiting. And you know how it is, the, the lunchroom chatter before the main event takes place. You ever been in an auditorium and there's just chatter going on and then the lights dim and they hit the stage and what takes place? And that chatter is going on. And around the corner, here comes that chariot of deity as it begins to roll. And chained to the chariot are sin and death and the very adversary himself. And all the saints at once begin to cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Victory, victory, victory is his. Victory is his. You see, with the ascension of the Son in victory comes the victory for you and me. How? In the descent of the Holy Spirit. For Jesus says, unless he were to go away, he, that is the Holy Spirit, would not come. He said, unless I go away, he will not send him. I'm thankful this morning that I have victory in the Holy Spirit, aren't you? I'm thankful this morning. I thank God that I get to preach by the very power of the Holy Spirit this morning. I'm grateful that my friends and my family and as many who would call upon his name have the power of the Holy Spirit living within their lives to grant them that eternal gift, that seal of approval, if you will, from now henceforth and forevermore that empowers them and allows them to live a life in victory. But you know what, church? It doesn't always feel like it, does it? How many of you feel like every day is victory? And here's the thing. There's only one of me, and there's many of you here this morning, but if I, I can provide you one word of encouragement for you to take with you for the rest of the week, I'd have you remember this. In Christ, you do not fight for victory, but in Christ, you fight from victory. Yes. Did you hear that, church? I said, in Christ, you don't fight for victory. He gives it to you. In Christ, you fight from victory, from a place of having already won. Before having already won, Jesus ascended as the victor. And therefore, we are granted victory not based upon our fight. But we are given it as a gift based upon his already having fought. Not only having fought, though, but having won. Don't you ever forget that, okay? Amen. Don't you ever forget that. So that's what the ascension means. That's the impact that it has upon our lives. But remember the second question. Why on earth start the talk of Jesus with the ascension that took place at the end of his life. And this is where we come to our final heading of the day, which is Jesus returned to sender. How many of y'all have ever got a bill that you didn't want and wanted to write on it, return to sender? <laughs> the ascension of our Lord into heaven was not his first time visiting glory on high. No, 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 church. It was his return trip home. The glorious teaching of the ascension is not that Jesus was uh, 
ascended to become some type of exalted man or to have upon him or placed upon him something that he previously did not possess, but that the glory of the ascension is that he humbled himself in the first place. The glory of the ascension is that he not only humbled himself, but died for you, died for me, and then returned to his rightful place in the universe as the creator and as the master and as the forerunner and as the victor. Listen to the words of Paul to the Philippian believers. He says, you, as all of you, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, what's the attitude? Who... Although he existed in the form of God. Did you catch that? Right. This isn't, you know, he came down and now he did enough good and so God's going to elevate him. He already existed previously in the form of God. He did not regard, get this, equality with God. A thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself. Taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. By becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now, just as the song we sang this morning said, I cannot begin to tell you all the intricacies of what it means that Jesus emptied himself. I'm not sure that any honest theologian or Bible student could. I can't explain to you how someone, some one person with so much power and with all the internal, eternal knowledge that there ever has been or could ever be. I cannot explain to you how someone with that would lay a portion or a part of that aside or perhaps veil it in human flesh. But what I can tell you with certainty is that before there was a baby that was born in a manger, Christ the King was seated in the throne of heaven. Amen? Amen. Christ the King wanted for naught. He was worshipped day and night without night <laughs> in the gates of heaven by the angels and by the heavenly hosts. He was robed with the finest heavenly linens. Upon his head was not a crown of thorns, but the most glorious crown that you could ever fathom. Within his hands that would soon be pierced, he held the power to create all things from no things. Within his feet was the power to tread on water, where if you and I tried to do that, at best, we'd sink quick, fast, and in a hurry. In his heart, the Bible says, was the fullness of God the Spirit, by which he would indwell and save every human who has ever been drawn to the bosom of Christ. You know that our Lord and Savior had it all, but even before the world began. He had it all before he entered into the womb of Mary. And while I do not understand it, one thing I know for certain, that this Jesus did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. That means as something to be flaunted. Something to be rubbed in your faces when you begin to mess up. But he that ascended on high first descended and came low. He was born without room, the Bible says. He was chastised as though he was alone. He was sought after not by those who would call him Lord, but after those who called him liar, you see. He was accused and he stood trial, never to open his mouth, but to say what you do, do it quickly. What you do, do it quickly. The Bible says he agonized in the garden. And when it came time to drink the cup of the wrath of God, do you know what he prayed? Do you know what he prayed in that garden? He said, Father, the time has come. I have done that which you have given me to do. And then he makes the most magnanimous of statements that any person could ever make. He says, now, Father, this is verse 5 of John chapter 17. Glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. <laughs> and for the Son to pray such a prayer, you must understand, he knew exactly what it would mean. He knew that it meant being despised and forsaken of men. It would mean bearing the lashes of the guards and their wrath and in their fury. It would mean being stripped naked, being beaten within the inch of his earthly life, carrying the weight of my sin, of your sin, upon his back, all the way up Golgotha's height as he carried that cross. Never once did he complain. Never once did he withdraw. Never, this, is, this blows my mind, never once did he call down that power which was but one breath away.
See, glory was coming. He knew that. But he also knew that it meant that agony must first be absorbed in full. And absorbed it was. And why? Why would Jesus do such a thing? And in that high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, you know why he said he did it? You know why he said he did it, church? For you and for me. Holy Father, he says, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. He did it for you. He did it for me. He did it for as many as would call upon that glorious and heavenly name. And so the beginning of the story is not that Jesus was born in a manger, but that he was before the empty manger. But that he was in eternity beforehand. And he is even still now in this very moment. The ascension teaches that Jesus' ascent was simply a return to cinder. He was returning home. He was returning home. And John sums it up so succinctly. I'm going to jump around in John a little bit. I'll give you John chapter 1. I'll give you 1 John chapter 2. I'll give you 1 John chapter 3. But this is what John says within his writings. And Miss Judy, you'll have known this because you just read it. Amen? The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that came into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And that Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the promise which He Himself made to us, eternal life. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called the children of God and such we are, amen? And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet appeared as to what we will be. We know though that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies Himself just as He, that is Jesus the Christ, is pure. You see, before the beginning began, these verses teach us that our Lord was there. Amen? He laid aside heaven's glories to take on flesh for you and for me out of an unbridled, out of an overwhelming, out of a relentless love of the Father's will. Amen? In that he secured for us the eternal life which is made sure of by the resurrection of the dead. For Paul says, without the resurrection we are of all the most to be pitied. But with the resurrection, can't nobody bring us down. Amen? We will be like him, the Bible says, glorified and perfected by the mercy and the power of God. If you believe that today, we're going to do three things. If you believe that today, we're going to do three things as we pray. Number one, I would ask you to ask yourselves humbly. Has Jesus ascended to the peaks of our hearts as the master of our lives? That's question number one. Number two. I'm going to ask you that he ascend as the forerunner to ever intercede on your behalf. The Bible says he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, just whispering in his ear. And guess what? Even when you don't know what to pray, the Bible says the Holy Spirit knows what you need to pray. And he's whispering it into the Son's ear and the Son's getting it to the Father. He knows exactly what you need even before you need to pray. Is he your forerunner this morning? Now as we pray will be the time. Number three, that we would realize that we don't fight for victory, that we fight from victory since Christ is the victor. And has granted us victory through and in him. Amen? amen. And amen. amen. And amen. May it always be so. Let us pray. Let us pray. Heavenly Father. Our Lord which art in heaven. God how could we do anything other than worship your glorious name this day. Father I pray that even in our hearts right now in this moment we would be quickened. To the point of new life here today. To the point of declaring openly and unashamedly that you are first of all. Our master. God, we commit to you this morning that even before we know the direction to which you have called us, that we would say yes to your will. Why? Because you are our master. But not just our master this morning, Lord, also our forerunner on this earth. You were tempted as we are. Yet the Bible says without sin, you died as our forerunner. That you might be the first fruits of the resurrection as an offering unto God. We thank you for that this morning. 
And we pray that you would be our conqueror, that you would be our victor in this and every day to come. God, enlighten us to see each day as a battle that we don't have to fight over and over and over again. But God, a battle that is already won. The victory already secured in Christ Jesus our Lord. And may we, God, may we with boldness and may we with confidence tell others about our master, our forerunner, and our victor. That he first descended in order that he might ascend. And bring down to us the Holy Spirit from on high. God, would you allow us to tell others about that truth today. Lord, break our hearts for what breaks yours as we stand and sing. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.